let's kind of go through these. So N for nitrogen, Na for why might we have done back to back with those two? They both begin with N, and if we go ahead and slide across to number four, we have Ni for nickel. Those are super common to get thrown on tests because the symbols all tend to kind of overlap even with the spellings. Okay. We move to Br. We have bromine. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet, but when we hit nomenclature, you might encounter the substance bromide with that D at the end. That isn't the same substance. Different thing. Okay. What is that difference? It's an ionic charge. The balance of electrons are different. It's still the same element, but we'd call it something else. Why would we bother to call it something else? They react differently. So that difference in reactivity we want to call attention to. Okay. So bromide is officially different than bromine. Okay, nickel, silver, okay, which is a fun one because nine times out of ten, usually what we get tripped up as SI, which is silicon, not silver. Sometimes we see AU float in there because it's both of them are kind of weird. AU for gold, potassium, K, which gets thrown in there because nine times out of ten. We get P. SI was silicon, P was phosphorus. phosphorus, different elements. So you have to be careful with some of those overlaps. When you go through and memorize, I told you which ones to memorize for a reason, you should go through and memorize those. You should also consider how might a test question focus on this. It's not just going to be tell me all the elements, okay, because we've got too much stuff to test over. Okay, so they will be pinpointing different things. The things that will get pinpointed will be the ones that have common overlaps. Okay? So think like a test writer, and you may already know all the questions I could ask. Make sense? Makes sense. Last one. Your opinion, what is the most important step of the scientific method? All together now, one big time. The answer is? Experiment. Y'all yes. Failure. Come on. Okay, I wrote failure in there. Okay, failure is the most important part of the scientific method, in my opinion. In my opinion, because it's not actually listed as one of the important steps of the scientific method, and yet it's arguably the most prevalent part of the scientific method, is that internal failure. Okay? If you wrote any other answer, are you wrong? No. Why not? Because it's your opinion. opinion. It's your opinion, so don't stress on it. Is that a hint? Kyle, is that a hint? Okay. So we good? Okay. How does this get graded? I will probably give you four out of five points for writing your name on it and turning it in. Okay. Um, mostly the quizzes are to kind of push you and say, did you actually start doing the prep work that you're supposed to be doing? Okay. That's kind of the intent. So if you had a hard time with those, you need to be working on that because the test is Thursday, next Thursday. Next Thursday. So, we've got a decent amount of stuff that we still have to get through. We'll see what happens with it. I'm going to bet we're going to get through most of it. Okay? So, we look at a periodic table. The periodic table is laid out like a grid. It's not a perfect grid, and there's some weird kind of holes and pots and things missing in it. Okay? And we'll discuss why those things are there when we know a little bit more about its organization. Okay? But if we look at it as just a blanket grid statement... We can break it down into two axes. We've got our vertical axis and our horizontal axis. The vertical axis is known as a group or a family. Okay? Those are, it's an important name to recognize because if we looked at how you interacted with the world versus how the rest of your family interacts with the world, there's probably going to be some close similarities. Okay? Even if you don't like your family, you're probably going to act very similar to them. Hi. Yeah. Hi. That's just kind of a feature because you're growing up with them and picking up a lot of their character traits. Same thing's happening within the periodic table. Within a vertical column, most of the elements within that column act similarly. 
right? They have similar traits and properties. So that's why we call attention to the families, right? Because we've called attention to the vertical row, we call attention to the horizontal row, but we don't get as nice of trends going on with that. Across the horizontal row, we'll refer to that as a period or a series, right? As we move through and come up with what trends we can find within these, that's ultimately how these terms get tested. I don't expect you to know that a vertical column is a group. I do expect you to know that atomic radius changes within a column. Which way does it change? bigger as it goes down. We haven't talked about that. That's in the reading. We'll get there. Okay? But I expect you to know that. What you're applying is the term groups or families to that, not just a vertical column. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, common names. If we look at this, this is stolen from the textbook, I believe. It's gone through and named a bunch of different areas. They arguably aren't that important to know the areas or those names of the periodic table but you might hear people reference them. Right? These are some of the more kind of common names for the individual groups. So group one is the alkali metals. Okay, so everything under lithium is known as an alkali metal. Why do we not include hydrogen? Hydrogen is a gas, but why would that mean I shouldn't include it there? What is a property of a metal? Solids or liquids. Hydrogen is a gas. Why is hydrogen on the left-hand side of the column or the periodic table then? It has similar properties to the metal. Even though it is a non-metal, it has some properties similar to metals. It also has some properties similar to non-metals. That does not make it a metalloid. It just means depending on its charge state, it bounces around. Okay? Same kind of thing happens with helium which is why on some periodic tables, you will see hydrogen not in that column. Okay. On some periodic tables, you will actually see hydrogen and helium fully separated from the table by a nice little white space. Why? Those two elements have slightly different properties that don't quite match everything underneath them. Helium does a better job of matching. Hydrogen is just a mess. Okay. So just be aware of that. So group one are our alkali metals. Group two are alkaline earth metals. How could I possibly remember that? Okay. For those of you keeping record, I didn't. I'm horrible at remembering that and couldn't, for the life of me, remember which one was the alkaline earth or which one was the alkali earth. And then for whatever reason, it just struck me. Alkali metals has how many words? Two. Alkaline earth has how many words? Three words, right? Alkaline earth metals. <laughs> to go from the alkali metals to the alkaline earth, I'm adding how many words? One. one. To go from the first column to the second, what am I adding? One. One. I'm adding one word. Second column is alkaline earth, alkali. It's dumb. Don't use it. You're supposed to know. That's a hell of a lot nicer. I like that one. <laughs> alkali, for those of you who may not have heard that, ends with L-I, which is the beginning of our alkali metals. I like that one a lot. Much better pattern recognition than myself. Okay. After that, for the moment, we're just going to do this. We're going to skip those guys. And we'll jump to our halogens, which begin with fluorine, and then our noble gases, which begin with helium. Right? So you're responsible for tying the names of that column back to the elements within it, okay, within that family. Kind of, sort of? So those four, absolutely you need to know. You'll hear reference to the transition elements, which is 30 to 21 as our column. It's that entire block. Right? So you might hear reference to that. It's relatively minimal for Chem 130 because we don't spend that much time there. The bottoms gets referred to as the lanthanides and actinides because it's the name of the element that begins that row, is the lanthanides and actinides. Okay? That's why they get called there. We don't even really have to worry about those. Those are like the rare earth metals, I think, what they call them. Did I do that right? Inner transition metals, whatever. 
Okay? We don't stress about that because those are all radioactive, so we don't encounter them. Okay? Why throw in the nitrogen and the oxygen? Okay, here's why. On three, I want everybody to say this word. One. Said on three. One, two, three. Isn't that kind of fun to say? Yeah, it's kind of cool. That's the only reason. It's just neat to say. Nictogens. Okay, the next one. The Chalcogens. I also think it's kind of fun to say. Okay, that's the only reason those two are there. That's it. Literally, that was it. Okay. So, physical properties. Okay, this gets back to Mendeleev and what's really kind of cool about this. So what we're going to do is ignore that top question, because I keep forgetting to delete it. Okay, and we're going to focus at the bottom question. Okay, so given the information above, what is a reasonable density for potassium? Okay, so we're seeing people look all sorts of different places. Some people are just looking at the ceiling. That's not helpful. Slides, periodic table, both of them are fine. What are you looking for? Or at? Rubidium. Rubidium. And then uh, sodium, uh, their densities. Okay. So I'm 100% I'm awesome with your conclusion, but what I'm going to argue is you've already done a bunch of internal analysis that you've, inter and again, internalized. I'm going to repeat it. Okay. I don't want you to internalize. Right now, you need to vocalize. What are you doing? What was the thought process that led you there? Okay. What patterns are you looking for? It increases. So I'm going to say the answer, based off the patterns that I'm seeing here, uh, is going to be 50. It was like, what? That's plus 20, plus 30. So, you know, plus 30 to get in there. That's 50. Isn't that a valid pattern? What's the question? Density. Density. So one of the things that you're doing with this, and you may or may not recognize that you're doing it, is that you're removing useless information. Okay? We aren't looking at the melting point. We aren't looking at the atomic radius. Where we're focused in is on that density. Okay? So now the 50 number, that was a stupid suggestion. Okay? So... Now what do we do? So we're focused on that density. Now what's the next thing we got to try and track? Okay, and this is where I would argue a lot of people shifted their view to the periodic table, which was good. What are you looking at on the periodic table to help you come up with an answer? Where's potassium? Where's potassium, where potassium on the periodic table? Where does it say potassium? Where does it say potassium? It doesn't say potassium, which gets back to the point. You need to memorize the language for your elements. You have to know those. Potassium is K. Okay, now we got K. Where is K? Under sodium and above rubidium. You mean in that giant black bar that Mike suspiciously left floating through the middle of the thing? Yes. Okay. Now, with that context, you can now start to draw parallels because we can see that those are all in the same column. If I had given those elements scattered across the periodic table, would I be able to draw parallels? No. Okay. So we have to find where those parallels make sense and take advantage of them there. We good? Okay. So what is our guess? Okay. We got a suggestion of 1.25. So, somebody else, because that was a nice volunteer answer. Why 1.25? Make a reasonable guess. It's if we look at how the densities change, they're always larger than the previous one, right? All the way through the trends that we've got. Yeah? Okay. So, 0 0.53, 0 0.97. So, it should be larger than 0.97. But the next one is never larger than the one after. 
right? So it needs to be somewhere in between there. We good? Where specifically within there? Why did you say halfway? So if we look here, 0.53 to 0.97 is 0.44. This one is 0.34, I believe. So it's not actually a perfect doubling. So we might actually back off of that estimate. So we can use this information to come through an interpretation. Make sense? You use the data to come to an analysis. Because right? we're always interested in how could I possibly ask a test question? This button. Oh, who's that? Who's at the door? Sorry. Let's try that again. Given the above information, what is a reasonable density for potassium? <laughs> Maybe it'll become relevant later. Okay. 0.72? Yeah. No. That doesn't make any sense. It's way too low. 1.23, we said 1.25, damn, good job, okay? 0.71, that's too high. Impossible to tell, can I really draw no conclusions about the density? No, you can. No, I can draw some conclusions, okay? So our answer becomes for the test, B, fantastic. And of course, the big reveal, and you go, that's it, that's silly, okay? So hold your breath, don't hold your breath, I'm take too long, okay? That is what I want you to do. What you just did there was some phenomenal explanations and studying of the results given to you to come to a conclusion. One of the things that students will do as they move through a semester is stop drawing those conclusions because they're afraid of being wrong. You will be wrong. And in fact, you are wrong. I don't care. Did you use the data at hand to come to a valid conclusion? Yes. yes. Does that change your answer for the test? Mm -hmm. oh, this, is, this is where you get like that instinct crawling in the back of someone's head, but it's the wrong answer. Did you draw a conclusion from the data provided? Yes. Does that conclusion make sense? Yes. yes. Which means the answer to this question is B. I don't care that it's not the exact correct answer. What I care about is the logic and thought process that goes behind following that pattern. That is exceptionally challenging. But that is what you need to be doing. Okay. It looked like it may have been a hand. You're going to hold it. You're okay? So on the test, the correct Just a sec. Yes, based off the data provided, because remember, what was our data provided? So if, if, feel free to go back and rewatch that, and you'll, if you pay slight attention, whenever we started asking about the specifics of the density, what did I say to do? I said, oh, someone was coming through the door, right? And what happens when someone's coming through the door? <laughs> what do you mean I provided information about density? Yeah, that needs to get deleted, and I keep forgetting to delete that. Because, yeah, that's, footnotes are always a killer. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, and apparently some people got tripped more than others on who came through the door. Okay. There wasn't like a mass like turning. That's usually what I hope for. But. Right? Does that make sense? We're good with that. So like on the test that they want to show where DRT wants to like cross out useless information or everything. Okay, so let's go back to test taking. Okay. Show your work. I do want you to show your work. Would I ask you to show your work for this question? Why not? It's multiple choice. Because it is multiple choice, it's likely to not be asked in a way where you could show work. The next part of it, okay, because you volunteered the answer first, so I'm going to pick on you. 
did you write any of those calculations down? Can you show me that piece of paper in front of you that has all the notes where you did those calculations? Right here. Exactly right. I'm not going to ask a question that you could theoretically do everything in your head because now I'm asking you to do busy work to show your work. Okay? When it comes to an exam for a multiple choice, should you still be showing work? Should you be crossing answers out? Should you be showing where those trends are? Yeah. Absolutely. Because okay? that is work that you can now evaluate and decide later, yeah, that work made sense. Okay? Or maybe if you went and showed your work and you were like, well, yeah, the difference there was 1.6. What are you looking at? Well, it's not 1.6. Exactly my point. If you write it down, you can now say that that was false. You have a way to analyze it. If you internalize that in your brain, you've lost track of it. You have no way of explaining why you came up with a different answer. Okay? So writing it down helps. Make sense? Cool. I personally really like that question. Most people hate it. So chemical properties. Okay? Within a family, they all act the same. Okay? So if I look at the alkali metals, that group one, okay, they all have the general formula. Metal two, so I need two metals to balance out one oxygen. So if I look at the oxide of lithium, it's Li2O. If I look at the oxide of sodium, it is Na2O. They all have that formula. Why? They all react the same. And I know they all react the same because they're in the same family. So I have that ability to, to call. Okay. Could I come up with a possible exam question for this? This is an activity is a nice thing for you to think about and go through, but it also takes tons and tons of time. Okay. So let's take a step from that and say, how could I ask this? Okay. How could I get at this concept through a multiple choice question? So which of the following is not in the family? And I could provide lithium, sodium, potassium, and SiO2. What's your answer going to be? SiO2. Do you have to know anything about this process to answer that question? No. So while that is a valid way to ask the question, you completely can do an end run around the content. You don't have to know crap about chemistry, and you can still answer it. Not a good question. So you could ask, what is um, sodium's oxide if lithium, potassium, and whatever is all this, that form, you, know? you know what I mean? I think I got it. So you're saying, given that information, Li2O, K2O, RB2O, CS2O, FR2O, what is sodium's oxide? Yeah? What are my answer choices going to be? to know the concept of families to answer this question? Yeah. No. Repetition. Repetition. Nope. That gives away the answer as well. So I like that. That's kind of a step up. That works, but it doesn't quite work out. So let's keep sodium oxide as our example. What is sodium's oxide given this information? So notice I deleted a bunch of stuff. Pretend that wasn't there. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to delete, delete. So there. Sodium's oxide. But now I give you this. Yes.
given that information, what is the formula for sodium's oxide? So now what are my answer choices? What is sodium oxide's formula going to be? A, B, C, or D? Okay. Why is it D? Because potassium is in the same family as sodium. Every single one of these answers has a root back to the given information. Does that make sense? Now, if you're just blindly guessing, you don't have a secondary context to apply on. You have to know the answer. Kind of make sense? For those of you new to experiencing test building, this is test building. Right? For those of you who are, why am I in a chemistry class about test building? What is your, the point of your education? That you can prove that you learned something. So at the end of your academic career, you can have a degree and say, I learned this. These people said I learned this. How do we prove that you learned this? On a test. If you don't know how to go through and take a test or understand how those test questions are built, it becomes harder you, for you to prove that you learned this. I'm giving you the tools to now be able to predict what questions could be asked. You're welcome. Or I'm sorry. Kind of make sense? OK. So periodic trends. Okay, so we've got atomic radius. This is a fun one. What is our measure of size? What is being measured with size? What is my size? We said height or weight. We said our size is going to be height, weight would be mass. Okay, so what contributes to height for an atom? The electron. So our subatomic particle is our electron. Right, so when we're being asked about size or our radius, we're saying, well, where are the electrons? Which do you think is bigger, hydrogen or helium? Why would you say helium? So first thing I heard was more protons. What did we just say makes size? Electrons. So what am I going to say to the proton answer? No. What what I expect for helium, larger or smaller than hydrogen? Admittedly, that's a tricky one, so let's try it the other way. Hydrogen versus lithium. Which would I expect to be bigger? Why lithium? Because it has more electrons. What dictates size? The electrons. If I have more electrons, well, I'm a bigger size. Okay? So there's two trends when we look at the radii. We could look within a group or family on that vertical axis, or we could look within a series or period, the horizontal axis. Okay? So we get two trends that we could go through and explain. Okay? Atomic radius increases as you go down a group. Why would it get bigger as I go from hydrogen to lithium to sodium to potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium? I get more electrons. So it should get bigger. Is that what the trend is? Sweet. Atomic radius decreases as we go left to right. So when I go lithium to beryllium to boron to carbon to nitrogen to oxygen to fluorine to neon, the size gets smaller. And that's because there are less electrons. Lithium versus neon. How many electrons does lithium have? Three. How many electrons does neon have? Ten. Aren't I getting more electrons left to right? Shouldn't it be getting bigger? More electrons means bigger. Shouldn't it be getting bigger? Yeah. Yeah. What does that say? It says it's decreasing. It says it gets smaller. So it must be a typo. Nope. It's actually right. It gets smaller. That's a little weird. Why might that be weird? Okay. 
The reason it's weird is we haven't discussed at all where the electrons exist. We have to have an understanding of how our electrons are located around the outside of the atom. If they're just out there, the more electrons, the bigger it should get. Since we aren't getting that trend, the electrons can't exist just out there. They have to just exist in different locations and in particular locations. Okay. So we have the first direct evidence of electronic structure based off of atomic radius trends. Okay. If we take a look at our trends down a column, you can see them get bigger. Left to right, you can see them get smaller. Left to right, does anybody notice the difference between carbon and fluorine, that little circle? Touche. I didn't expect that, but that's a fair answer because I was thinking size. Okay. The colors are different, yes. Does the size look obviously different? Mm -hmm. Not too much. Okay. Depending on the level of chemistry, you may change your interpretation of size changes left to right. Okay. Is the size officially changing? 0.077 to 0.064. So it is indeed getting smaller left to right. So there has to be some explanation for why we can add more electrons to an atom and yet have it get smaller. Okay, right? Right? Make sense? Does anybody want to hazard a guess? Hazard a guess as to why it gets smaller left to right. It is a pretty big hazard, admittedly. I even get teachers and tutors screwing it up. Okay, so yeah. Deal with that. Sort of. The more electrons you have, elicits the fact that you have more negative charges, correct? And doesn't that make the value kind of smaller? Maybe you have more electrons. So you're saying more electrons means it should get smaller. Look down the column. No. If we look at just the electrons, down a column and through a row are opposite trends. Any explanation we use that involves just the electrons is wrong. Because as soon as we come up with an observation, it's going to counteract with the other trend. Way to volunteer out there. So we could go with the number of protons. When we go left to right, what happens to the number of protons? Get more protons? They get more protons. If I have more protons, I have a more positive nucleus. What is that more positive nucleus going to do to the electrons? It's going to track them tighter, which would mean it gets smaller. You're on to something. What happens when we go down a column? They get bigger. What happened to the number of protons down a column? also increased, oh, okay. which would mean if we look at just the protons, we still have a conflict, okay? And that's the biggest rub within this, is everybody tries to come up with a trend and explain based off of electrons or protons. Both of those are inherently and patently false statements. You can't do it. You have to evaluate both, okay? So... There's another way to represent it. We could look at atomic radius or metallic character as well. They transition kind of with each other. Okay. We'll talk more about drawing periodic tables uh, on the exam and arrows and stuff when we get closer to the exam. So we'll jump back to chapter four to talk about electrons. The biggest thing that comes out of chapter four is not all this wave nature of light, but it's kind of an aspect. When we look at light, it breaks down into two primary categories, wavelength and frequency. When we combine that information, we can bring it all together to get a concept of the energy of that light. Right? We would reference that energy as part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Right? Part of the electromagnetic spectrum is... Not my eyes. What would my eyes see? Visible light. Visible light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. 
So we could go through and break things down, look at energy, wavelength, frequency, all that fun stuff. And ultimately, here's what I want. Wavelength is the distance between two peaks. Frequency is the amount of peaks that would show up within the exact same distance. That's it. I don't want any calculations. So I don't need to know any of those numbers. I don't even need to know the speed of light. Right? That's all I really want you to recognize is the relationship between wavelength and frequency. That's it. Okay. With that, we can go through and look at our electromagnetic spectrum that ranges all the way out from cosmic rays and gamma rays, which then gets weaker to X-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, microwaves, TV, radio, all that kind of fun stuff. So that's our whole electromagnetic spectrum, and we get the visible spectrum right in the little tiny, tiny little piece in the middle. Okay. Parts of this that I want you to remember are differences in energy. Okay. Which end of this is the highest energy? Okay. The cosmic rays. Okay. What made Hulk? Gamma. gamma rays. Hulk became really strong when he absorbed... And gamma rays, only because they were high energy. If he in, absorbed radio waves, he'd be a puny, weak little dude. Instead, gamma rays became massive, hungry, strong dude. Okay, so gamma rays, this side of the spectrum is the highest energy. Okay, which means the lowest energy, the other end. Okay, visible light, which one's closer to our gamma rays, purple or red? Purple, which means purple's higher in energy. Okay? So if we go through with that information, we could now apply to something like red, green, blue, yellow and say which one was higher in energy. Okay, so I do expect you to manipulate that. What are the colors of our rainbow? Okay, so we heard get shouted out, which I appreciate. Roy, G, Biv. And for those of you who have not heard that, Roy being the first name, G being the middle name. Biv being the last name. Doesn't have to make perfect sense, but there you go, Roy G. Biv. Okay. You'll note that that is kind of flipped from how this is written out, okay. because Viv G. Your wasn't a cool name. Okay. So if we remember all of the colors of light, we now need to remember the energies associated with it, okay, which I almost always screwed up, but we just established it. Which one was higher energy? Violet. Violet. And we said violet because it was closer to gamma rays. Well, the only reason we could say it was closer to gamma rays was because why? Because we could see that it is. So if I did this, which one's higher in energy? That becomes a little harder to do, right? Okay. So one option is you just have to know it, which is why I consistently got this wrong on tests. Okay. So is there another way we could go through and do this? Is there another part of the electromagnetic spectrum that you're somewhat familiar with? Particularly in, say, the state of Arizona. Sun. What about the sun? Uh, yes. <laughs> Color? What are we concerned about? Color. UV Skin cancer coming from? UV radiation. UV radiation. What does UV stand for? Ultraviolet. Ultraviolet. So when we step outside into the sun, we are afraid of ultraviolet radiation. So what do we do? We put on shields to protect ourselves from the ultraviolet radiation. Has anybody walked outside and been like, are you afraid of the IR radiation today? No. Well, that doesn't really come out very often. Why? It's not as harmful. The ultraviolet is more harmful. Why is it more harmful? It's more higher in energy. Hulk smash. It's higher in energy. <laughs> Which one's closer to ultraviolet? Violet or red? Violet. Oh. See where I'm going here? This is high energy. Since ultraviolet is high energy, that means must mean that <coughs> violet is the highest visible energy. Okay, you don't like that one? Is there one for the red end of it? <coughs> Infra red. We aren't concerned about infrared radiation because it is lower in energy. Where's infrared radiation located? Closer to red or violet? Red. It's 
in the name. There we go. Ta-da! Yeah? Okay. So what do we do with this? What we do with it is that we take our little tubes with virtually no substance in it, and we put some gas into it, and we put a gas of a particular element. Okay? In this case, the easiest element that we had access to was hydrogen. Okay? And just like kind of most scientists do, we find something cool, and then we just apply that something cool to everything. Okay? So what we found cool was electricity, electrons. Okay? Kind of like, I don't know, like a cattle prod. When we had that cattle prod, it was really cool. If we scale down the cattle prod to like, you know, the little electronic buzzers, okay? And you put on your hand and go, oh, yeah, let's shake hands. And you electrocute the other person. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, one person. Okay, you go, oh, that's cool, that's fun, exciting. We did the same thing, but we did it to elements, okay? To do it with an element, though, we had to use a slightly higher energy. That's why we referenced the cattle prod, okay? So we've got a cattle prod, and we shove it in the element. We fire it up, and we watch what happens, because why not? We found something cool with electricity. Let's see what it does to things. Okay. When we did that, what happened? It emitted a cool light. Neat. Okay. Believe it or not, you emit a cool light too when you put a cattle prod under you. It's not pleasant. Okay. So it's a very high energy state. Okay. We also noticed, with other cool things, prisms. If I take a prism and shine that up, what do I see? I see the colors of the light that's passing through it. It breaks down into a spectrum. Okay? So if I line that prism up with you know, my cattle prod element, just to see what light, what color was in it. Okay, well, it's a purple light, so I might just expect, if I was going to look at the results from the prism, just a bunch of purple colors. right? Just a nice big old section of purple. Instead, what we got out of this is what they're showing with this image. I didn't just get a spectrum of purples. I saw three lines. One that was red, one that was blue-green, and one that is violet. What? Why would that be the case? Okay. That's a challenging question. Okay. That question is what Bohr then tries to go through and answer in the next step. Okay says, well, what am I likely exciting? Well, electricity is the motion of? Electrons. Electrons. So if I put 20,000 volts into an element, the likely thing that's moving is? The electrons. The electrons. Well, according to our model of the atom, the electrons are just outside the nucleus, which means they can exist at all energies. Close to the nucleus, they should be canceled out because we're canceling out the charge. Far away from the nucleus, it's very, very high in energy because it's not close to cancel out the charge. So if I put in 20,000 volts, what's going to happen? The electrons are going to jump all over hell and gone. As they're jumping around, I'm going to get a spectrum of energies. Do I see a spectrum? No. What does that mean about my model of the electrons existing at all over the place? It's wrong. It's wrong. My electrons have to exist at very discrete locations. So if we take a look at Bohr's model of our atom, we've got our nucleus, and we have these orbitals, okay, which are oftentimes referred to as orbits, which is horribly false. Okay? It's orbitals. Okay? And if we picked an atom, let's pick a simple atom like hydrogen, where do you think that first electron is going to go? The first orbital. Why should it go to the first orbital? It has to fill it first. Oh, Why should it have to fill the first orbital first? Why does it want to be close to the proton? Opposite charges. Opposite charges attract. We're going to the lowest energy state. That's why we go to the lowest orbital, because we're trying to balance out the charge, make it more stable. How many of you are standing in this class taking notes? No one? Why not? You're in your lowest energy state, sitting down while you go through and take notes. Same thing's happening with our electrons. Okay. What happens if I now give that cattle prod 20,000 volts? So underneath one of the seats, we've got one of those little electronic buzzers, and I've got a handy-dandy little button box over here. So we'll test this, just like we tested with the orbits. Okay. And as soon as we push the button, we'll see what happens when we put a little bit of electric current underneath our electron. 
You guys ready? Yeah. Gotta push the button. It's ready. <laughs> it's, it's just a microphone, actually. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> what would happen? Why are you all panicked? Like, he's not going to do this, right? He didn't do this. <laughs> what would you do if you got electrocuted? You're going to jump. What's the electron going to do? It's going to jump. Will it jump to the next orbital? What if it was only a mild shock? Are you going to jump? No, it has to be enough of a shock to cause you to want to jump. Guess what happens to the electron? It has to be a strong enough shock that it can do what? Bridge the gap from one orbital to the next. So my cattle prod forces this to jump to the highest energy state. Okay, so let's say somebody jumped up. Duh. What's going to happen eventually? You might throw your chair at me, you might walk out, but let's just say we're all together and happy and we decide, ah, that was a funny joke. Eventually, what are you going to do? Sit back down. Sit back down. Okay? That energy was released. In the case of you jumping up and down, it was released as heat. What's happening with our electron? It's being released as light. So when that electron returns back down to that state, it emits light, which we can sometimes refer to as that H nu. That's our energy of our light. That energy gap happens to correspond to the colors of our atomic line spectrum. What if I'd given the electron more than just that little voltage? Could it have jumped to the next one? If I give it enough, yeah. When it comes back down, is it going to emit the same energy? No, it'll be a slightly different energy gap. Will it be more or less? Should be a larger energy because it's a larger step. Which means what would I expect the color of the light to start to shift towards? Red or violet? Should start to shift towards violet. This first one could correspond to red. If we go through and test this with different elements, we notice the same kind of thing, that every element generates a different atomic line spectrum. Why? Every element has different electrons. Every element has different protons, which means the exact energies of each of those orbits is different, which means we could see different things come out when we pump the 20,000 volts in, okay? which is kind of a neat phenomenon. Because of that, Bohr gets kind of immortalized in this, and we get the quantum concept. The quantum concept is saying we have discrete energy levels. That word was important. Discrete meaning defined. Steps are discrete. Okay? If you tried to climb up the steps, how many of you took a step and a half before you moved on to the next step up? No, what happens when you took a step and a half? You go down to one step. Okay? It's a discrete energy. You can only exist at those stages. But if we used a ramp, would you be able to take a step and a half? Yeah, because I can exist at all of those energy states. Stairs, we can. When we look at a rainbow, continuous spectrum. I can exist at any of those states. When I look at atomic line spectrum, discrete. I can only exist at the steps. What do you think about an elevator? It's kind of a weird one. Kind of, sort of, both. Because when you step in an elevator, you can exist at all places when you move up and down. You can only really go out at each of those levels. Okay, kind of make sense? Okay, so we now have our evidence for energy levels. When we look at the atomic line spectrum for hydrogen, here's all of our orbits. Turns out there's seven of them. Okay, seven. Let's ignore these bottom two rows for the moment. Seven. There's seven what? Rows. Uh, I don't want to accept a row. Seven. Periods. Okay. Each of the rows or periods on our periodic table corresponds to an energy level for the electrons. Okay. Neat. The periodic table has it. Believe it or not, the lanthanides and actinides are embedded within this. They're still part of six and seven. 
Okay? So we've got our seven energy levels. When we go through and look at the nice little drawing here, we're saying an electron drops from the third to the second energy level for hydrogen. You'll notice it's not going to the first. Why not go to the first? Could it go? Regardless, we only have one electron for hydrogen. Could I not go from three to one? I could. Why is that not in my atomic line spectrum? Is it losing enough energy? It is. Why can't I see it? Why is that line not in my atomic line spectrum? Which part of the electromagnetic spectrum is the atomic line spectrum showing? The visible light spectrum. Jumping from 3 to 1 is going to correspond to a larger energy jump than 5 to 2, meaning the light emitted from 3 to 1 is higher than purple, higher than violet, ultraviolet. Can we see that? No, we can't see ultraviolet. That's why we don't pick it up. So when we're talking about our atomic line spectrum, we're only referencing jumps that happen to coincide with the visible line spectrum. That's it. All the other jumps can happen and do happen. We just don't get direct evidence from it using our eyes. Okay? So what we've got are our energy levels. These come from our atomic line spectrum. And we've got cool, fun science. Okay? So these are often known as atomic fingerprints because every element has a different number of electrons and protons. All of their orbital energies are slightly different, which means we get different atomic line spectrum for every single element. This becomes really useful, say, for astronomers, because what can they do? What does an astronomer do? They observe the stars. They can aim a telescope at the stars, and what are they seeing? The stars' light. What's making that light? The excitement of the electrons within the energy of an individual sun causing an atomic line spectrum of light to be emitted from that sun. We can break down the line spectrum from the sun and decide what elements were present in that solar system. That's cool. By your blank stares, you don't think it's as cool. That's okay. It's cool. Okay, so electron homes. Let's go through and begin. Our nucleus is going to be somewhere down here. Okay, way down low. So this line right here represents the first energy level. Being a creative person that I am, I'm going to call that first energy level 1. The next energy level I will call two. Two. And three. And four. What do you notice is happening? It's increasing. The gap between them gets smaller and smaller. Why? There's another line up there. What is that other line representing? The maximum energy. The maximum energy. Sort of. What happens if I exceed that line? The electron goes away. What do you mean it goes away? It just doesn't exist. It's no longer associated with that atom, that nucleus. It's now exceeded that connection. So what we're referencing is the highest energy is our vacuum. Once we've cleared the vacuum, we don't worry about it anymore. It's no longer affecting the rest of it. So we would end up with seven energy levels. right? Because I like colors. There's colors. Where would the first electron go? The first energy level. Ta-da! Electron, because I'm creative. There's a line, right? like we're tallying. Where's the next electron going to go? Second energy level. Why would you put it in the second and not in the first? Why would it be not relaxed to go in the first? Why would I not want more than one electron in the same space? They'll repel each other. There's a repulsive force. So if I've got seven energy levels, as I continue to put electrons in, how many electrons would I be able to place? Seven. seven, which would explain all 118 electrons that I could possibly get for the highest element. 
7 and 118 don't equal each other. What's missing? What's wrong with this explanation? I can put more than one into each of those energy levels. Okay. When I first drew it, you had me draw, I drew a little arrow on it, representing the spin of the electron. Believe it or not, when an electron spins one direction versus the other direction, they kind of can hide each other's charges and they don't repel away from each other. So I can fit two. Where's the next electron go? The next row. The next one. Next one. Wait for it. That would mean how many electrons? 7 times 2? 14. Does that explain the periodic table? No. So something else is still going on here. This something else has to do with what happens at each of these energy levels. Every time we move up in energy, we get a new orbital type. Okay? All we've referenced are energy levels. It turns out that we also get orbital types. Our first energy level only has one orbital type, and that's it. Why only one? Because it's the first. When I move up to the second energy level, I will get two orbital types because I have a second energy. Move up to the third, three energy levels, four, four, and so on and so forth through the rest of them. Okay. Again, still only two electrons in each, and if we still populated that all the way out, we still wouldn't account for the periodic table. Okay. For the second one, you put six. So, so for the second one, something different happens, and that has to do with what those orbital types are. We start with the bottom. It starts like a circle. The reason there's only one is how many different ways can I rotate the circle and have you know that the circle was rotated? So envision this, I take a ball, close your eyes. Okay, like two people responded, thank you. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Would you be able to tell I rotated the ball when you opened your eyes back up? No. There's only one valid orientation. There's no way to tell the difference. Which means there's only one orbital. When I go up in energy, okay, just like everybody else, we learn from the past. So when I go up in energy, I copy. So I get the same sphere shape. Okay? But the next one, that extra orbital, has to be different. And it has to be different because it can't overlap with this one. Okay? At least not overlap a lot. So that new shape comes in, it looks like a dumbbell. If I now took a dumbbell and turned it, would you know that it was turned? Yes. yes. So it turns out for that dumbbell shape, there are multiple orientations. We reference these as the y, x, and z axes. So that means when I go up to the second energy level, I get the s, or sorry, the sphere, and I get three p shapes, which means if I'm going to go through and fill electrons, the first energy level, how many electrons can I put in? Two. When I move up to the second energy level, how many electrons can I put in? Six. Six. Two for the sphere shape, and then I get two for each of those orientations. Okay? Which would mean? Eight. Okay? For that energy level. If we continue to move up, we could continue to add things into it, and we'll deal with that in a little bit. But that's why these shapes are showing up, why these orbitals are here. These all fall out of quantum mechanical, mathematical, mumbo-jumbo stuff that is awesome and fantastic, and you should all learn about it after like six more years of chemistry, classes of chemistry. Okay? You don't want to do that? Fine. You just get to deal with this. Okay? So what we are talking about is where the electrons are allowed to exist. So if I'm going to start to put electrons in, my first electron is going to go where? And the lowest. Tell me where I place that electron. Bottom does not count. 
in the first orbital, uh, I can accept part of that. I'll accept the first. Why? What was the name of that black line? One. So I place the electron into one. Okay. This will become problematic because if I move up in energy, how would I differentiate these from each other? Well, they'd all be two, so that doesn't work. I need an extra piece of information. This isn't just one. This is one sphere because it looks like a sphere. Okay. Do we want to write out sphere all the time? No. So what do we come up with? We come up with a code to represent it that's shorter. That code in this case is calling that type an S type. So that first electron goes into the 1s orbital. Where's the next electron go? Into the 1s. Why into the 1s? We can fit two per orbital because the spins go opposite directions. Anybody think that looks kind of tedious to have to do that? I could make this 1s2, where the 2 in the upper right-hand corner is in reference to the number, the number of electrons, kind of like where we would note the charge. charge. There's our electron count. Okay. Where's the next electron go? Two. Into the second energy level. So I could call it 2. Okay. But is that two different than if I put it here? Yes. So I need a better name. What do I want to call it? 2s, next electron. 2s2. Okay, so I could again write out the 2s. I'm going to abbreviate 2s2. Where's the next electron? 2d. Where's the next orbital? Still the second energy level. So it's 2. Why do you know it's P? What did we do with the sphere? I said, I don't want to write out sphere every time. Do you want to write out dumbbell every time? No, so we want to come up with a name for it. What's the name we choose? P, why? Because in German, the word for dumbbell begins with P. Okay, so we get 2P. Okay. Or it's pinched, sure, I like that. Where's the next electron go? 2P, next electron. 2p, next electron. Now we can double up. 2p, next electron. How many could I fit in those p's? I get six. How many electrons do I fit in the second energy level? Eight. The second energy level holds both of those orbitals. It's referencing the number. All right. How many electrons fit in the s? Two. What's the very first element that's going to place electrons? Hydrogen. hydrogen. Look at the row for hydrogen. Remember we said that was the first energy level? We said those are energy levels? How many columns are in the first row? Two. How many electrons could I fit in the first energy level? Two. <laughs> second energy level. How many columns in the second energy level? There's our eight. But you'll notice it is broken into two pieces. The first two columns, and I get this weird gap, followed by one, two, three, four, five, six columns. The first two columns, followed by six columns. The first two columns are also known as the S block. Why? If you look at their electron configuration, their outermost electrons are located in S orbitals. If we take a look at the block boron to neon, everything underneath that is also known as the P block. How many columns were in that P block? Six. How many electrons fit in the P orbitals? Seriously? Yeah. All of this orbital information, already there. 
third energy, we have lowest one. Three S. Third energy with third row. Two elements right at the beginning, right? Two columns. There it is. Then we move up to 3P. Third row. How many in the P? Six. Cool. There it is. Then we move up to D, the cloverleaf shape. And you're like, well, how's the D? Well, I don't know. Let's see what happens. So after argon, we would then move to the D elements. What did I say the first two rows were? The S block. That's not the D block, is it? No, that's S. Why the weird pattern shift? That's how the electrons fill. We skip 3D and fill 4S before we fill 3D. And we do 4S followed by 3D. We get a weird shift in how the fill rate. For the S, we said we could fit two electrons because two electrons because two columns. For the P, we said we could fit how many electrons? Six. Because there are six columns. six columns. For the D, how many electrons do you think we can fit? Greater than nine, less than 11. <laughs> 10, because there are 10 columns. How many orbitals are in the D block? An orbital holds how many electrons? Two. How many orbitals are in the D block? Five. five. There's now five orientations for the D. All of that information is embedded in the periodic table. It is hard to find, and it takes some practice getting used to, but all of this stuff that we're talking about with electron homes is already in the periodic table. You just haven't acknowledged or found it yet. Okay? The hardest thing to acknowledge within this is everybody freaks out. You've already dealt with this in your life. Tell your friend how to get to your house. What do you provide them with? Directions. To find where your house is on the globe. That's a lot of stuff to have to process. You mean kind of like the state, the city, the street, the address? That's all this is. We're identifying the homes for electrons. Neato completo. We'll pick